how would you summarize the book of Acts? The Acts of the Apostles, we just read through it on Monday. We finished our scripture reading of the book. That started on the fourth day of our scripture reading, and here we are six months later, finally finishing the book, 28 chapters in. On Wednesday night, two Wednesday nights from now, we're about to finish our study of the book of Acts. So go ahead, start making a list. How would you summarize the book of Acts? What are important elements? What are the key themes? What is one sentence that ties the whole book together? You could say, as I often have, that maybe the theme is that God is near to whoever would go to him. It's pretty prominent in there. God is willing. He wants people to come. So he invites them all, and you see that as he proclaims the gospel to the Jews and to the Gentiles, as he welcomes everyone who would believe. Maybe you see the title of the Acts, and you see it's the Acts of the Apostles, and so you prescribe it, and you say, well, this is the Apostles' work. This is what they're doing, and indeed, it does follow that story. The first 12 chapters following the Apostle Peter, uh, chapters 13 through 28 follow the Apostle Paul. It is indeed the work of the Apostles, but is that all there is to it? Maybe you could summarize it as the life and job of the church. Because you see that throughout the book, right? Acts 1, the prelude to the church, 120 people meeting in a room. And then Acts 2, the official day the church is established. And you watch the churches spread as it goes from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. Maybe that's the theme of the book. Well, all of those are true. But how could we tie those all together? How could we tie those into one sentence that really gets across the point of the book. You find it in the last word of Acts, Acts 28, verse 31, the very last word in New American Standard anyway, when Luke declares this as an unhindered effort. And that's the summary. When you get to the end of everything, Paul is preaching, and Paul is still there. Still there. Totally. Totally. Here's a little summary statement. The word goes out unhindered. Three parts to this sentence. The word, part one, goes out, part two, unhindered is the descriptor. And that's your little three-point sermon right there, if you want to think of it that way. Let's break that down very quickly. It's very, very simple. You have the word, the truth of God, that God is near and calls all to him. That word, it's truth, it never changes. And from chapter 1, it's a word about Jesus, the Savior. And in chapter eight, uh, chapter 28, as we'll see, it's the word about Jesus, the Savior. It never changes, and they face all sorts of obstacles and opposition. It's still the same, because Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Truth doesn't change nor adapt to the situation. It's truth and it's still right. But it doesn't do you any good to have the truth if the truth never goes out, does it? It's all well and good for you to be saved, but if you never share that with someone else, how will they know? How will they hear? They won't have the message of God. And so the other important element is the work of the apostles as they take the word out into the world. And the third important element is really the most important of all as God steps in. And make sure that no hindrance, nor obstacle, no opposition, or, uh, or anything from the opponents of the word will get in the way. God's word, when taken in God's way, accomplishes God's work. The word goes out unhindered. And without any of these three, it falls apart. If you don't have the word, you don't have the truth. And it doesn't matter how much you take it out. It doesn't mean anything. If you have the word and God clears your way, but you never give it, then what did it accomplish? If you have the word and you go out, but you keep getting blocked and the word never spreads, there's no point, is there? But God works all these three together in such a way that everything works out in the end. That's your high-level summary of the book of Acts, all accomplished in just a few minutes. Now, we'll look at some examples. 
for the rest of this evening. A couple of basic examples, and then a couple more in-depth examples of how Acts bears this out and how the writer Luke shows us what happens. In fact, the first example doesn't even come from this book itself, but consider this and think, who could this be? There is a man who has the truth. He takes the truth out, he preaches it, and in the course of preaching it, spreading it to everyone, far and near alike, he faces opposition to the point that he is killed, but then God brings him back. Isn't that just Jesus? He has the truth, he takes it out, he faces opposition, he even dies, but God works through that, removes the obstacle, and everything ends up very, very good. The word continues on even with what Jesus went through as God delivers him in the end. The word goes out unhindered. Then you have another example from the early chapters of Acts as you look at the apostles. And don't you see the same message borne out in their lives? If you remember Acts 4 and Acts 5 especially, you see the apostles, you see Peter and John healing the lame man in the temple in Acts chapter 3, but then in Acts 4, they're brought before the courts, and what do they do? They had the truth, they preached it, they're brought on trial, and God brings them through it, so they face no punishment. Acts chapter 5, they're preaching the word, they have the truth, they preach it, they're put in prison, God frees them from prison, and they go out to preach again. They have the truth, they're preaching it, they're brought before the council again, and even though they're beaten, and even though their lives are threatened, God brings them through it. And the summary statement in the end of Acts 5, in Acts 5 in verse, oh, what is that? Acts 5 in verse 41, the apostles went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they'd been considered worthy to suffer shame for Jesus' name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on preaching and teaching Jesus as the Christ. That's the New American Standard translation. I'm preaching from it tonight because I love how that verse reads. They kept right on teaching and preaching. Why? Because the word goes out unhindered. Am I getting the point across? Do we understand where this is going? This is the book of Acts. All over the place, Luke hammers this idea again and again. Whatever the opposition, whatever the competition, with faith in God and a firm grasp on the truth, these men take out the word, and it goes and accomplishes great things. doesn't matter what comes against them. God wins in the end. And that's what we'll look at for the rest of this evening as we focus on two specific examples. Firstly, we'll look at Stephen in Acts 6 and 7. And secondly, we'll look at Paul and Silas in Acts 16. Firstly, Stephen, turn to Acts 6 and 7. We'll read a good chunk of this chapter, of this this first chapter anyway. Chapter 7 is pretty self-explanatory, and it's uh, very long-winded. Stephen here is going to be put on trial. Do you remember what happens in Acts 6? I know it's been a while since we read it. The Hellenistic widows, or the Greek widows in Jerusalem, have been overlooked. And they're upset because they've been missed. They're supposed to get a daily portion of some sort, and yet it's been passing them by. They raise a complaint. The apostles solve it by picking seven men, and Stephen is one of them. What's the result? And even this story itself is a little example of the thing that we've seen. There is, uh, there is the truth. The church should take care of its own. There's a problem. It's not doing that. But there's a removal of the blockage as the apostles step in and anoint seven men to take care of the issue. The word goes out unhindered. Do you see the response to this in Acts 6, starting in verse 7? The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, And even a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Despite the problem, despite the opposition, despite the internal conflict the church is facing, they solve the problem, and God works through that to bring even the priests into the household of God. Now look at Stephen as his part in this. Because what we see in Stephen is that Stephen has the word. Let's start reading in verse 8. 
And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen, but they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. I love that translation of verse 10. They are unable to cope with it. I, I like New American Standard. It's a good version. It reads fun. Stephen has the word. Stephen has the truth on his side. Stephen has the spirit of God. And in both truth in teaching, in his miracles and signs, he is proving the message of God. The word is spreading. Many are being converted. I can't help but believe that Stephen's a major player in that, given that he's the next big focus. He has the truth. And what does he do? He goes out with the truth. And he preaches it even to a large audience. It names Cyrenians, Alexandrians, Cilicians, and Asians, and also the Jewish officials. He'll end up getting there. I thought I removed that, but oh well. Do you see verse 9? He's preaching to a synagogue of what's called the freedmen. All these people from all around the world, all ending up in Jerusalem somewhere. Now, I don't know if they're permanently in Jerusalem or if they've just gone and visited Jerusalem for a while and they're temporarily settled there and they're going to go back home. I'm not sure. But you know what? The word starts with people only in Jerusalem, but now it's starting to spread elsewhere. Do you know where all these locations are? Do you know where it starts going? I did a thing where I put up a map. I think it works. It does. That's good. I've never done this before. But you know, do you know where the message starts? It starts in Israel, Jerusalem area, a small room in the corner of Jerusalem, 120 people. By chapter 2, it's grown to 3,000 people. By chapter 3, it's grown to 5,000 people. By chapter 6 now, he's talking to men from Cyrene, which is over there, west, uh, the mid of North Africa. He's talking to men from Alexandria, Egypt. It's a pretty major city. He's talking to men from Cilicia, that's southern Turkey. And he's talking to men from Asia in general. That whole region, I believe it's Asia Minor, that whole area of people. The word is going out. It's not restrained by the persecution of the apostles in chapter 4 or chapter 5. It's going out, and no longer is it just in Jerusalem. It's starting to spread to people from all of these different locations. What happens when they go back home? Maybe, just maybe, some word might spread to them. Now, those people don't like Stephen much. Unfortunately, even though Stephen has the truth and even though he preaches it well, they're not willing to listen. Let's start reading in Acts 6 and verse 11. Now, then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people of the elders and the scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. They put forward the false witnesses who said, This man incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law, for we have heard him say that this Nazarene, Jesus, will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? And Stephen preaches. Interesting, isn't it? Even in the opposition, you think that putting, being put on trial before the council, you'd think that would be a little bit of a roadblock, and yet Stephen goes right through. Continuing to preach the word, continuing to preach the truth. You notice that suddenly he's not talking to the normal people in the temple anymore. He's not talking to the random inhabitants of Jerusalem or even of those random cities no, now he's talking to the higher-ups and the highest level. Now the council is seeing him and seeing in his face the face of an angel, and they know something special is going on. Now the high priest is questioning him and himself bearing witness to the fact that God is with this man. The word, because of Stephen's diligence, the word is going out to all sorts of people who might never encounter it otherwise. 
Stephen has the truth, and Stephen sticks to the truth. Do you know what his message is? We're not going to read verses 2 through, 40, uh, through 50. It's a long message where Stephen basically says, we share the same history, and I can prove it to you. And he tells them all about where they came from and where he came from. But look at Stephen's ultimate conclusion to this passage. In chapter 7, verses 51 through 53, look for the main root of his message. What's the message he's proclaiming? You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You were doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become, you who received the law as ordained by angels and did not keep it. What's the root of Stephen's message? You see a condemnation there, but what's at the root of it? There is a holy one. There is a righteous one who came for you, and you were supposed to listen to him, but you didn't. And there's a condemnation because you didn't listen. The message is that Jesus is the Christ, that you guys need to pay attention to him. That's the same message we started with in the first and second chapters. What's the result of that? Stephen has the word. The message doesn't change. He sends it out even to the high priest. What's the result of that? Verse 54. When they heard this, they were cut to the quick. They began gnashing their teeth at him. But Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Jesus is at the right hand of God. He's been glorified by God. That's the message. They kill him. He dies in the next couple of verses. Even as he dies in verse 60, he says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Jesus, forgive their sin. Jesus can do that. That's the message he's proclaiming, even as he dies. That's some opposition, right? That's a kind of hindrance. Stephen can't preach anymore because he's gone. And even it gets worse than that. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him, but Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women, he would put them in prison. Now there's a hindrance, isn't it? Now there's a little bit of a block on how much you can do and how well you can preach and how much you can send the word out, correct? Luke doesn't think so. Look at verse 4. Therefore, all who had been scattered went about preaching the word. The word goes out unhindered. Stephen has the truth. Stephen preaches it, and even as he faces opposition and is killed, the church preaches even more. God takes him to heaven, and suddenly there's a realization that shame is not a barrier because we don't have to be ashamed of God. Death is not a barrier because the Christian goes right to heaven. Suddenly we don't have to be afraid anymore. And even though we may scatter over the continent and around the surrounding areas, we go out and we preach the truth and the word of God. There is no hindrance. There is no block because even though this man has died, he lives on with God. And that's a message that needs to be taken out. Despite suffering, it often brings with it the word goes out unhindered. And nothing can stop it. Are we the type of people who would suffer for the word? Are we of Stephen's caliber? Often, probably not. But that's how we got the word today. Is men like Jesus, like the apostles, like Stephen, standing up and proclaiming the truth, even in the midst of a world of unrighteousness. Stephen preaches, dies but is ultimately delivered, and the word continues on. We pick up this theme later in our second example for tonight. In Acts 16, with the Apostle Paul, 
the Saul that was killing Stephen, the Saul that was persecuting the church in the very next chapter. He has a change of heart and attitude when Jesus intervenes and speaks to him and blinds him. Suddenly, Saul turns around and he becomes the most prolific of the apostles that we know of. In one of his journeys, the second one, chapter 16, he comes to a city named Philippi. Him and his assistant Silas and their partner Timothy that they picked up on the journey, they reach the city called Philippi and they meet on a riverbank. Acts 16 in verse 13, on the Sabbath day, we went down outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. You see here what Paul says in verse 14, a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Do you see what Paul is doing? Paul has the word. He takes it. And he takes it to where someone can listen. He goes out with the word, and he starts preaching the message. He walks to a riverbank. He finds a few women there. Well, that's not much, but it's something. And that's where we start. And he preaches to one woman, and that convert, that one convert becomes a whole family of converts. And now there's a church started there. And now he continues to go out even further. Let's read this story. We're going to start in verse 16 and read down through verse 25 or 27 or so. Let's read this story and keep count and keep track. Paul does he spread the word? And if so, who is affected by it? It's quite a list. Start reading Acts 16, verse 16. It happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl holding a spirit of divination met us, who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying, These men are the bondservants of the Most High God, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for many days. But Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. But when our masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs which it is not lawful for us to accept or observe being Romans. And the crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore the robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And from that one convert, in the jailer, his entire household is converted. Verse 33, the word goes out unhindered. It just keeps on going. Did you notice how much of the city is thrown into chaos by the words Paul said? Paul, he, Paul preaches to Lydia. He preaches to the slave girl. He preaches to the jailer, and the prisoners are listening in. Lydia and the jailer and both of their families are converted. The slave girl is freed from her demon possession. I don't know if she converts or not, but I have hope. The prisoners here, I don't know how much opportunity they have, but I have hope. But even so, the masters in verse 19 have heard the name of Jesus Christ casting out demons. The word has gone out and they've heard it. They've seen the power of God. The chief magistrates have heard that there's a disturbance about this, this name or this demon being cast out, and they know something's going on. And as a result, even the whole city, the crowd, all of the people are upset 
and join in this this mob, granted, but they are all reacting because the word of God has touched the city, because Paul kept preaching. The outreach starts with one woman, and now the entire city is reacting just because Paul kept spreading the word. Paul has consequences for this. He's imprisoned, totally unjustly. He's beaten horribly and then imprisoned, thrown into stocks, and that's not a pleasant experience. He's thrown in the middle. In the middle of the prison, it's dark, and it's at night. It's the middle of the night. It's probably pretty cold in there. And then what? Does he stop? Does he quit? Does he give up? No, of course not. He's Paul. He won't stop going. He does start speaking. He does start proclaiming the message of God. Did you notice in verse 25 what he does? He starts praying and singing hymns of praise. Now notice, these are hymns of praise. In the prison? In the dark? That's a weird detail for Luke to include. These are hymns praising God for what he's done, (laughs) evidently. That's the message of God, that even in the darkest of times, there is still hope. His form changes, not sermons, but songs, but he still reaches out to other people. What would they have sung? Songs of praise in a prison, what might they have sung? Not exactly sure. I can only guess probably some psalms from back in the day. They wouldn't have sung anything from our hymn books, but I have some lyrics from hymns of praise that we have that might have been fitting for the situation. What would Paul have said? in the prison. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust, and feeble as frail in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. In a prison, Paul is praising God. How could he do that in the darkness? Rest of the weary, joy of the sad, hope of the dreary, light of the glad, refuge from danger, strength to the end, home of the stranger, savior and friend. After he's been rejected by everyone, after he's been unjustly in prison, how can Paul carry on? God will bless the brokenhearted, and his goodness I will see. Though my dreams had all departed, he is near to comfort me. Standing here amid the rubble where my earthly hope had soared, I will turn to him in trouble. This time I will praise the Lord for the gifts that he has given, for the gifts he will not give. I will praise the God of heaven. I will share in him and live in the joy of present blessing, In the hope of loss restored, by my faith I come confessing, this time I will praise the Lord. How can you still praise, Paul? How can you be thankful for the situation you're going through as everybody is against you? Let all who stand with Christ the Lord, each good and faithful servant, take up the shield and bear the sword with heart and spirit fervent. Behind the rock of ages and armed with holy pages, if God be for us, who can fear? Oh, let us be courageous. Almighty God, whose outstretched arm is certain to defend us, we pray where'er the present harm into the conflict send us by calling and election. With power and protection, our cross of duty leads from here to crowns of resurrection. What keeps you motivated? What keeps you motivated in the dark times when you're cast away from everything and everyone? How do you keep going when all other lights go out? If you were in prison, what would you say? What would you sing? Our Lord sees every Christian die and feels each dying breath and calls out from a field nearby, be faithful unto death. Our brethren dead beneath the plain whose spirits never died Rise up to march and shout again, O Christ, be glorified. Must I be carried 
to the skies on flowery beds of ease, while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas. Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. What happens when you spread the word and are rewarded with a prison cell? What happens when you put your all on the line for God and suddenly you end up in a bad situation? It turns into an opportunity, that's what. With God, even the inside of a prison where you can't see anyone else is an opportunity to proclaim praise and to bring people to him. Because all the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Whether good or ill betide me, whether skies be dark or clear, Jesus stays so close beside me that I know and feel him near. The message doesn't change. Sure, it changes forms, but in the darkness, in the prison, they are still praising God. He will save them. He is with them. And Paul proclaims that truth. You know what happens? God hears that. God hears Paul claiming how good he is. Paul hear, God hears Paul praising him, and God frees him so that he would go out and preach even further. There was a hindrance called a prison, and God breaks the stocks, and God breaks the locks, and he lets them out free. They go, they preach to the jailer, they convert the jailer and his family, and as a result, a church is in Philippi, one of the greater churches that Paul found in the New Testament. The word goes out unhindered. Different forms, but the same message. God will save. Whatever the situation, whatever the form of presentation, the word goes out. Are we using what we have to take and spread the word? Even when you get to chapter 28, we'll just look at this very briefly. Paul's been dragged to Rome. He meets some Jews there, and in verse 23 of chapter 28, he gives the same message. They had set a day for Paul. They came to him in his lodging in large numbers. He was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus. From both the law and the prophet of Moses and from the prophets from morning until evening. Some were convinced, some weren't. But in verse 28, you know what? The word's going out anyway. And it's going out to the Jews. And if the Jews don't listen, it's going out to the Gentiles so that everybody would hear. And so we get the famous last words of verses 30 and 31. And he stayed in Rome two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, proclaiming, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness, unhindered. That's the message. It always is. The message doesn't change. It stays the same because when you take God's word and you use it in God's way, it accomplishes God's work. And so the word goes out unhindered. We also have the truth. Do we preach it? Do we take it out? Do we face opposition for it? Or maybe we would if we did, in fact, take it out. Do you trust in God to see his word through today as he did in prior days? Because the fact is, the word goes out, but it really needs its messengers. Messengers who are willing to suffer. Not just the preachers, not just the elders, not just the guys who lead the public worship, but everyone is a messenger for God. We need to be willing to suffer for it. Everyone gets scattered in chapter 8 and verse 4, and everyone goes and preaches the word. Those are normal Christians. The apostles stay behind. The normal Christians go out and establish churches after God's pattern. God needs messengers willing to suffer. God needs messengers who teach the word in different ways. Not all of us can preach. Not all of us should preach. Definitely not all of us want to preach. And that's okay. Go and spread the word how you can. Maybe it's not here in a public place. Maybe it's not here even in a Bible class. Maybe it's a quiet night and you go out to a coffee shop and you set up a meeting and have a Bible study. Maybe it's a 30 minute lunch break that you have with one of your friends at work and you just share a couple verses with them and ask them to think about it. How do we share the word? Maybe it's not even preaching or speaking. Maybe we go to a park and we sing out in public and people hear. Maybe that spreads it too. 
God doesn't need a bunch of preachers. He needs a bunch of Christians who go out and who do the work in all these different ways. And God needs messengers who don't give up. Whatever the consequence, they don't quit. That's the message of the book of Acts. That's the core of the church. What can you do where you are? Use God's word in God's way. Do God's work. What's stopping you from being the one who rises up and takes it out? This phrase, the word goes out unhindered, that's a summary of the book of Acts. Is it a summary of your life? Because that's what we are called to. Is there any help you need in establishing your faith? Is there any help you need in taking it out? Is there any help you need in trusting that God will see it through? Because he will. If there's anything I can do, let me know. I'll be right here as we're all standing and singing this song.